Hello, everyone. A warm welcome to the second episode of Listening to the In-Between. In this three-part podcast series by Radio Artes, we will explore various aspects of deep listening, a practice developed by the American composer, musician, writer, and humanitarian Pauline Oliveros. In this last minute, we have been listening to an excerpt from Lear, the first track of the 1989 album Deep Listening, with Pauline Oliveros, Stuart Dempster, and Panayotis. I'm your host, Sharon Stewart, a deep listener, sound designer, and researcher for the Artes Professorship Theory in the Arts. In this podcast series, we put the practice of deep listening into context by providing backgrounds, relevant theoretical concepts, and practical exercises you can do yourself. In the first episode, host Yup Christenius and London-based researcher Ed McKeon offered us an introduction to the life work of Pauline Oliveros, and Colombian sound artist and researcher Jimena Alarcón spoke of her recent work and research and her connection to deep listening. Yup also introduced us to the extreme slow walk, and if you haven't yet, I would like to invite you to take a listen and try it out yourself in a time and place convenient to you. The potential of this practice as a mode of philosophical action or the realization of embodied knowledge was explored in Ed McKeon's article, Moving Through Time, published on Apria in September. In the time between that episode and now, on the 5th of October, 2022, Artes Studium Generale, in collaboration with Artes' Master Interior Architecture, Corpo Real, hosted a hybrid event around Pauline Oliveros' deep listening practice. Nearly a hundred students and participants took advantage of the opportunity to explore the acoustic space around Zvola's Sofia Chabau and Zvola's Conservatory building through collectively performing Oliveros' seminal deep listening practice, the extreme slow walk. Jimena Alarcón offered a telematic listening experience through her recently developed Intimal app, and students of the Master Interior Architecture at the Corporal Real Lab offered the workshop Spread Power by Space, Research by Making, to investigate the relationship between power and space by exploring the space with the body and research through the act of making. Themes that were explored through these practices were the interrelations between the outer and the inner world through sonic awareness, listening to the in-between of real life and dreams through telematic connection and movement, and actively researching spatial, bodily, and mental powers. In this second podcast, listening to the in-between, sensing traces of power and powerlessness, I wanted to further connect the idea of an embodied practice with the theme of power and powerlessness by working with others through the creation of scores, also conceptualized as rituals of attention, that offer a way of listening to or sensing aspects of power and powerlessness in an embodied way. The practice of creating listening questions and listening scores was developed by Pauline Oliveros over many years in her work both with those who identified as musicians and those who do not. These explorations led, in the early 70s, to the compiled set of 25 sonic meditations, whose impact was discussed in the first podcast. And 2013 saw the publication of Anthology of Text Scores, a collection of over 100 of Oliveris' pieces and meditations for soloists, groups, and ensembles. Writing and sharing text scores and listening questions is a generative and creative practice at the heart of deep listening. That being said, exploring the theme, listening to power and powerlessness, adds a layer of focus that is not typically central to the practice of deep listening. Yet, the methods used were informed by my years of personal practice and facilitating deep listening workshops and online sessions for the Center for Deep Listening at RPI and elsewhere. (music) 
So, following the event on the 5th of October, we sent out a call for participants, students and others who are willing to enter a three-week creative process of finding a source of inspiration, whether text, film, or work of art, etc., that deals with the question of power or powerlessness and imagining ways to investigate this question in an embodied way through listening and sensing on various levels. Meeting online three times to share concepts, ideas, and challenges. And then using this chosen source of inspiration and online sharing to develop a text score that invites others to enter a ritual of attention that explores this question of power and powerlessness in an embodied way. And finally, for those willing, talking about, and sharing parts of their process for this podcast. So I am very grateful to have had the opportunity these past few weeks to work with two participants who are here with us now. Lawrence Kruger, a second year student in the Debe Cave program, a bachelor for teacher of fine arts and design at Artes in Zvola. And her artistic attention is currently circling around themes such as awareness of temporality in life, creating space and time for loss and dealing with overload. She's also investigating tensions around the objecthood of the body. And Martina von Lübeck, a recent graduate of Bayer, base for experiment, art and research with her bachelor's in Arnhem. Currently, Martina is involved with trying out ways of thinking, feeling with the earth through artistic research. She is developing tools for embodied listening so that through these we can become aware of the ways we are intertwined with each other and generate new forms of being together. So good evening here now. Welcome to both of you. And really, thank you so much for engaging with this call, for the supportive discussions we've had and for sharing your process here with all of us now. So um, my opening question is, Which aspects of power or powerlessness were you interested in exploring? And which inspirational material did you draw upon? And of course, maybe it was that you had inspirational material and that led you to be interested in aspects of power and powerlessness. And that's fine. So I'll um, give you the floor or the microphone, Martina. Yes, thank you so much for having me, Sharon, first of all. and yeah, so to, to dive into your question straight, um, I think the theme of power has already been present within my own artistic practice for some time, but I could not find the right ways or words to articulate it yet. But I think this thinking, feeling with the earth that I explore through my practice actually stems from an overwhelmation. Uh, an overwhelmation of the exhaustion that comes from capitalist society, at least Western capitalist society. And I think in that the tension between being part of this force of power myself as being a participant in this capitalist society in contradiction to also wanting to escape this or wanting to find new ways of being together Uh, I think in that lies this paradox of power, which I'm very interested in exploring. And I feel like this is also a tension that, at least within my own surroundings that I see with my friends and family, it's it's also a fear, um, a fear of how to how to be in this world that accelerates way faster than that we could ever live. And I do think that. Um, this force of power also connects a lot to language. For my graduation, I researched the Rhine River for a year, or actually I researched with the Rhine River for a year, to be more precise. Um, I I went to her, uh, I listened to her, I invited people to come over and listen together. And at first, I really felt that this was a one-way street uh, one way of communication i felt like i talked to her but she did not talk back Um, but after a while i actually discovered that 
a certain sound or a certain splash meant that a certain ship was passing through. So I feel like after some time, I I was able to understand little bits of her language more and more. Uh, and I think this is a very important force as well. What language do we use? I am a Dutch native speaker, but it's also a language of colonization. We're talking in English right now. It's also a language of colonization, but also a language that's accessible to most people. So I think these two forces of of capitalist power and language, which is tied to the capitalism as well, were the, the fuel of creating my score. For creating the score, I also read the text Returning the Gift by Robin Wall Kimura uh, as a main source. And in this text, she stresses the urgency of practicing gratitude through a shift in mindset from seeing the earth as a mere resource, which we do in capitalist society, towards acknowledging the gifts that the earth brings forth. So in a sense, she actively asks the reader, after becoming aware of the gifts we receive on a daily basis, what can we actually give back to the earth? And uh, one of our responsibilities is to become familiar with the beings that we live with, so indeed to learn their language and to find ways of being together through our commonalities within language. And I think that also shows a certain respect. Maybe the last thing I say about the text is a, is a quote. Um, it's a short quote, but I think it's beautifully written. We have to change our language because it shapes our thoughts and actions. When maple is an it, we can take up the chainsaw. But when maple is a her, we have to think twice. Thank you, Martina. I think I saw Lawrence nodding as well, and I think we all hear bits that resonate. So thank you for that. And um, Lawrence, I will pose you the same question. So I think a starting point for me to to join in this uh, this process was that I was thinking for a long time already about how to find ways for an escape when I find myself like caught in dualistic paradoxes. Uh, as often paradox uh, exists in two kind of tension points. And I found like a way to, 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 to deal with this by triangulating the dualistic opposition. But I was also very interested in finding out things about how to look at my bodily experiences with this. And because I come from like a more of a thinking background, uh, I approach things theoretically. And to connect these ideas about how things, about uh, analyzations about how things maybe function to very bodily um, feelings, is often very difficult. So I lose myself in the thinking while I use this thinking to make sense of all these feelings. And I had heard about this um, books of Foucault in which he writes a history of sexuality. And I wanted to delve into that because it seemed to me that I could maybe find some entrance points there. And also I want to re read them because I'm very curious. But then... There are so much much things you you want to explore and do, and uh, these these books uh, stayed in the stack. Like, and then I found this text. It's called "The Subject and Power," and I wanted to um, read this because I was thinking that would be a short introduction to his thinking about history of sexuality, and to, uh, to take this as a starting point and for devising a score. So I started to read this, but it was very heavily theoretical. Uh, and also not so much about uh, history uh, of sexuality as I was thinking. 
it's more like a text in which he explains that his, of course, Foucault is, no, is uh, known to be like the big uh, thinker about of power and power structures. But in this article, he says that his work wasn't so much about power, but more about inquiry about uh, the different modes by which in our culture human beings are made subjects. So it's about also a response to moder- to modernity, uh, I suppose. Yeah. And this ties in with my own feelings about how can I look at myself and my body from an inner point instead of objectivizing myself and then being lost because the connect- I can't make the connection between the inside and the outside. Can you tell us a little bit about the process then of creating the score? So you've read the text, you found it, you discovered it was more analytical than you were expecting, and it, it started a train of complex thoughts, but you had clearly defined for yourself areas of investigation. So just, I'm very curious about that process, and then you can um, begin, and then Martina can also join in in a bit. And we're th- in this process, um, you can tell us anything you want, but also I'm curious if there were other aspects of power or powerlessness that you came across that you were maybe not expecting. Well, my process was very unexpected because uh, I, I had read the text and was inspired by certain notions because it coincided with other ideas of myself that surfaced again, and so on and so on. But then I did not know quite what to do and take as a next step uh, in in our idea or of devising a score or discovering a score, and I think I went to bed, and uh, the next morning I had to be somewhere, and I uh, was on my bike, and I felt so tired, and I felt my tiredness was like a kind of swimming underwater. In the kind of water you can't really see a bit. You you can can see a bit. Uh, but not really everything is blurred and I was fighting that that blurry state of being I recognize that I have this often and I fight it because I want to have a clear mind and then I felt I was like stretching out and really stretching my neck and head as if I was really swimming and trying to to be above the water I recognize this as a a rather stressful energy I often have and that it was a kind of very bodily dealing with uh, the energies that come from my background. Like my father and mother had very exclusionary energies and uh, this, this stretching out and and being on top of things was like an energy that made me just reminded that, that in a certain way I, want, I wanted to to do this better than my father to be better in thinking and better at keeping track of everything and knowing where I was going to and then I I recognized that this was a kind of these were kind of bodily uh, oppositions that I was like triangulating in myself and in that way it was an escape of the dualistic structure of my father and mother if I just could like accept to swim (laughs) with myself Um, well that that was a yeah surprise a discovery a a new way of, of feeling and looking at this and I was so happy and I tried to to do this just accepting my tired underwater swimming and while I was doing this and cycling (laughs) I suddenly heard music in myself and it was an Ave Maria a soundtrack uh, a version of the Ave Maria which is very well known and has this tremendous movements in itself about stretching, reaching for something uh, and then also grounding and uh, getting down again and and swelling, uh, getting up again and I I felt 
a kind of letting go, also in a very bodily sensation. It was kind of having balloons in my hand, white balloons, and they, I, I let them go and they would go to heaven. <laughs> it's a very spiritual experience. And then I realized this was what I had to do in a certain way. I could, I could take like the, the key points of the tensions that my body was describing and bring that to a, to a score. Lawrence, I'd love to hear your score. Yeah. You can introduce it with a title, however you want. Yeah. The title I chose was Triangle Dance with Force Fields. One, think about an important force field in your personal life. Two, think about the force field that forms an opposition to this first one in your life. Three, imagine to enter one of them completely. Embody it. Feel what moves, posture, position, results. Four. Break. Five. Repeat with the other force field. Imagine it. Embody it. Feel resulting moves, posture, position. Six. Break. Seven, step into the embodiments and move at will between them. Feel a new position emerging. Eight, feel into this new position. Nine, wait. Ten, Look back. Discover the relative distances between the three positions. 11. Feel a new movement emerging that relieves you from the orbital power of the dualism. Move. So, Martina, I'm curious about your um, process of creating your text score. Um, also curious if there are any aspects of power or powerlessness that you came across that maybe you weren't expecting. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I think it's almost impossible not to uh, within any creative process. But after having read Robin Wall's Cameras text, I realized that her idea of reciprocity was something I wanted to to grab or actually hold on to. And I wanted to relate this to my own embodied listening experience that I do within my own artistic practice. So for me, naturally, the first thing to do is to go outside and to have a wander around where I live. I really like thinking through doing or thinking through feeling. I think that's one of my main modes of research. And when I was walking around my neighborhood, I tried to listen through my ears very carefully about any possible more than human languages that I did not know yet or wasn't familiar with yet. But one thing that really struck to me, and I guess this is one of the power forces that I didn't expect is that the thing I heard most were cars moving around, cyclists that were ringing their bells. It was not a lot of more than human beings that I heard, which is quite normal maybe in a city, but I really felt that I would be able to adjust my attention more to these other sounds. And after listening very carefully for quite a long time, I was able to make a distinction between some of these more than human sounds, but they're also not that 
present anymore within, at least not within the neighborhood that I live in. So I think it was more of a realization or a confrontation with how more than human beings are almost not present anymore within these visible infrastructures I live in. Um, but then I thought, okay, but let's let's find one more than human being that I can see or hear or smell or actually use any of the senses. And that's precisely what I did. I found a tree in my street that I look upon out of my window. Um, and I based my score on that tree as a whole to think how I could not embody the tree, but be embodied with the tree. And it resulted in a score that is actually circular. So it's a multiple day score. And at the last day of the score, it's the same action that you do as on day one, which also enables you to continue practicing the score with maybe the same more than human being or with another human being. Uh, which also really relates to this reciprocity within Robin Wall Kimmerer's text, which I really enjoy. Would you mind um, reading us your score then now? That would be wonderful. And these scores will be available as a PDF also in the podcast notes. And for everyone's listening, of course, we welcome you to um, try out these scores and write your own. Before I begin with reading the score, there is one word I use within the score that maybe not everyone is familiar with, and it's the word ki. It's a pronoun that is also introduced by Robin Wall Kimura as an alternative to the pronoun it that we used to refer to most beings that are not human. Um, so it's also coming back to this idea of of power and language and of objectifying more than human beings, such as the maple tree that I gave the example of. Um, and Robin Wall Kimmerer proposes the word key, singular, kin, plural. Uh, that stems from the word kinship as well. So, yeah, in contradiction to the word it. He actually proposes a certain closeness, or maybe not proposes. I feel like the closeness is already within us, but it pinpoints this closeness that we already have, or it enhances this closeness. Um, so now I will continue with reading the score. Um, I called my score actually the title of the article, which is Returning the Gift. A score for thinking, feeling with the earth. So it's a five day score. And I will start with day one. Day one. Sit or lay down and take a moment to tune in with your body. How did you express yourself today? How did you move, speak, touch, taste, smell, feel and share? What languages do you harbor? Write down a list of your findings. Day two. Choose a more than human being that you feel connected to. A tree, a body of water, a butterfly. Take two minutes each to look at, listen to, smell, touch, and if possible, taste Ki. Write down how you got to know Ki today. Day three, return to Ki. Through being with Ki, imagine the things Ki has given you and your fellow humans. Express your gratitude towards Ki in a language of your choosing. And take a moment to feel the gratitude spreading throughout your body. Day four, return to Ki again. Take two minutes each to look at, listen to, smell, touch, and if possible, taste key. After what key has given to us, imagine what you could give to key in return. What does key need? 
and if possible, give Key what Key needs. Day 5. Return to your body. Sit or lay down and take a moment to tune in. How did you express yourself today? How did you move, speak, touch, taste, smell, feel and share? What languages do you carry with you? What can you give to the earth? Write down a list of your languages. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here, for sharing this process, and I wish you both a very good evening and looking forward to performing your scores. As you can hear, in going through this process of finding a source of inspiration and translating it into a text score or embodied ritual of attention, Lawrence, Martina and I were confronted with a language challenge. We all chose textual sources and each source offered a different connection to a performable activity. The body understands and speaks through doing and sensation, which asks for a certain performative language and cadence. I immediately thought of the paper, Uses of the Erotic, the Erotic as Power, presented by Audre Lorde at the fourth Berkshire Conference on the History of Women, Mount Holyoke College, on the 25th of August, 1978, and published as a chapter in Sister Outsider in 1984, as my source of inspiration. In her public appearances, Lorde would often introduce herself by saying, I am a black, lesbian, mother, warrior, poet. And for me, her writing and poetry stem from her deeply felt experience, her unwavering commitment to telling her truth, grounded in an unrelenting openness to both historical and contemporary events, her vast knowledge of and connection to literature and poetry, and the travels, teaching, dialoguing that took her all over the world, connecting with others, in alignment with the spirit of intense engagement. In other words, Lord's essay already feels as if it springs from embodied practice, especially when you hear her read it herself. Now there are many kinds of power, both the ones we use and the ones we do not yet use, acknowledged and otherwise. The erotic is a resource within each one of us that lies in a very deeply female and spiritual plane. It is firmly rooted in the power of all our unexpressed and unrecognized feelings. The erotic is a measure between the beginnings of our sense of self and the chaos and power of our deepest feelings. It is an internal sense of satisfaction to which once we have experienced it, we know we can aspire. Once having experienced the fullness of this depth of feeling and recognized its power, in honor and self-respect, we can require no less of ourselves. That was Audre Lorde, and in the following I will include more excerpts in her voice that guided my process. The link to the entire recording is also in the podcast notes, and of course I highly recommend that you listen to her entire talk. When I first read her essay in 2004, it had a profound impact on my personal and professional life. This writing guided the direction of my research in music pedagogy around feminisms, technology, and improvisation in connection to claiming a libidinal creativity. Now, returning 18 years later, I find myself able to connect in an even deeper way with her work. One of the specific aspects of this work that I incorporate in my score is attention to the joy of connecting deeply with others. The erotic is the nurturer or nursemaid of our deepest knowledge. The erotic functions for me in several ways. The first is in the power which comes from sharing deeply any pursuit with another person. The sharing of joy, whether physical, emotional, psychic, or intellectual, forms a bridge between the sharers, 
which can be the basis for understanding much of what is not shared between us, and it lessens the threat of difference. The joy of connecting means not only sharing sameness, but sharing difference. Lord was invested in the welcoming of difference as a generative source of change, both within Black communities, as she writes about extensively in the paper Learning from the 1960s, as well as across racial and class divides within feminist and women's studies communities. In another paper called Uses of Anger, Women Responding to Racism, she writes that, quote, The strength of women lies in recognizing differences between us as creative and in standing up to those distortions which we inherited without blame, but which are now ours to alter. The angers of women can transform difference through insight into power. For anger between peers births change, not destruction, and the discomfort and sense of loss it often causes is not fatal, but a sign of growth. Part of this process of coming to terms with difference lies in another aspect of her talk that I drew upon, that of fully opening to and taking responsibility for one's own emotions, whether joy, rage, grief, fear, or passion. But when we begin to live from within, outward, when we begin to live first from that deepest place and then out through the extensions of ourselves into the lives that we inhabit, in touch with the power of the erotic within ourselves and allowing that power to inform and to illuminate our actions upon the world around us, then we begin to be responsible to ourselves in the deepest sense. This is in no way a shallow call to focus only on self-care, but to embark upon an understanding of our own emotions as a source of energy that can serve to bring about change. This might involve, for example, directing our own rage, putting it to use to dismantle structures such as racism in whatever ways we can. In the paper mentioned above, Uses of Anger, she writes, quote, After I read from my work entitled a poem for women in rage, a white woman asked me, are you going to do anything with how we can deal directly with our anger? I feel it's so important. I ask, how do you use your rage? And then I have to turn away from the blank look in her eyes before she can invite me to participate in her own annihilation. I do not exist to feel her anger for her. End quote. Once we are able to engage poetically with our own existence, and I understand this thinking with Lord to mean that we honor the chaotic contradictions that are inherent in the fullness of our own being, then we can engage with others in a way that fully sees them without making use of them. To refuse to be conscious of what we are feeling at any time, however comfortable that might seem, is to deny a large part of the experience and to allow ourselves to be reduced to the pornographic, to the abused, and to the absurd. Now, the erotic cannot be felt secondhand. As a black lesbian feminist, I have a particular feeling, knowledge, and understanding for those sisters with whom I have danced hard, worked hard, played hard, or even fought. This deep participation has often been the forerunner for joint concerted action not possible before. And that is what we are about here, isn't it? This leads to a final aspect that I've worked with in my score, and that is about the tendency to withdraw, distance oneself, or shut down. An extreme form would be to disassociate. In the face of powerful emotion, such as existential fear of what one perceives as a threat to one's physical or psychic self. In touch with the erotic, I become less willing to accept powerlessness or those other supplied states of being which are not native to me, such as resignation, despair, self-effacement, depression, self-denial. 
Recognizing the power of the erotic within our lives can give us the energy to pursue genuine change within our world, rather than merely settling for a shift of characters within the same weary drama. For not only do we touch our most profoundly creative source, but we do that which is female, that which is self-affirming in the face of a racist, patriarchal, and anti-erotic society. I would like us to keep in touch with those deepest feelings that we have, and perhaps it will help us bridge some of the very real differences and some of the very real ways in which we see our course separately. Thank you. Finally, I mentioned engaging poetically with our own existence earlier. Through this whole process, I've received a better understanding of Lord's relationship to the written word as a tool to process, transduce, and share experience. In Poetry is Not a Luxury, she writes, quote, Poetry is the way we help give name to the nameless, so it can be thought. The farthest horizons of our hopes and fears are cobbled by our poems, carved from the rock experiences of our daily lives. And, quote, Poetry is not only dream and vision, it is the skeleton architecture of our lives. It lays the foundations for a future of change, a bridge across our fears of what has never been before. End quote. When an interviewer asks her, why do you write poetry? She answers, I write because I am a warrior and poetry is my primary weapon. And so I have written as much as I have because I have a responsibility to do this work in the world. End quote. Some of my most vivid and enjoyable childhood memories were of writing poetry or allowing poetry to come to me. In engaging contemplatively with the Lord's poems, I can say that some were painful, confronting, heart-crushing, shame-inducing, and I could observe myself wanting to turn away. Her poetry opens the cavity of my chest, leaving me gasping for lack of the usual words, the padded, woolen words which cushion my white-ish world. Her poetry shapes the tongue of my mind around a new language, angling my blinders to a new perspective. This is good work, and I welcome it. In respect for this relationship to the written word, to poetic writing, I also turned to stream-of-consciousness writing in the four-day score I created, called Listening to Connection and Difference. Day 1. Take time today to tune into your lower belly as you transition from one task to another or one place to another. Bring your awareness to your lower belly. Breathe. Sense the sensations without immediately trying to name them or put them into words. At the end of the day, take five to ten minutes to write a stream of consciousness letter from the perspective of your lower belly to yourself. Begin writing with something like, Thank you for listening to me today. I'd like to... And then follow the stream of words that arise without stopping. Day 2 Take time today to tune into moments when you disconnect from yourself and from your environment. Take time to notice when you feel empty or at a distance from yourself. Breathe. Notice the state without immediately trying to put it into words. At the end of the day, take five to ten minutes to write a stream of consciousness letter from the perspective of this sense of disconnection. Begin writing with something like, Thank you for tuning into the disconnect. I'd like to... And then follow the stream of words that arise without stopping. Day 3 Take time today to notice when you are sharing deeply with another person or being in your environment. Take time to notice the sensation or feeling of this connection. Breathe. 
sense the sensations of the feelings without immediately trying to name them or put them into words. At the end of the day, take 5 to 10 minutes to write a stream of consciousness letter from the sensation or feeling of this deep sharing or connection. Begin writing with something like, Thank you for listening to the deep connections. I'd like to... And then follow the stream of words that arise without stopping. Day 4. Imagine a person or group who makes you feel uncomfortable or with whom you have conflict, or a situation in which you feel unwelcome or untrusted. Hold this person, group, or situation for a moment in your heart. Breathe. Sense the sensations or the feelings without immediately trying to name them or put them into words. While holding this person or group or situation in your heart, take the three writings one by one and read them out loud using your entire body to the imagined person, group or situation. Listen for a response and take five to 10 minutes to write a stream of consciousness letter from the person, group, or situation to yourself. Begin writing with something like, thank you for sharing all these things, I'd like to, and then follow the stream of words that arise without stopping. Thank all involved and release the process. It has been a great joy to connect with Audrey Lord and her work through this process, and I extend a warm, encouraging word to each of you listening to also try creating your own scores in which you listen to power and powerlessness. In the podcast notes, you can find links to the works mentioned here, including Audrey Lord reading her own poems. In light with the theme of this podcast, I particularly recommend power. To conclude, I would like to once again express my gratitude for the participation of Lawrence and Martina and express our gratitude for this opportunity to share our explorations, discoveries, and performable scores with you. Thank you for listening.